I will be speaking on the topic management of acute variceal bleeding. It's a very common topic we physician deal uh, oftenly uh, these cases and uh, if you uh, promptly diagnosis and the prompt management can save the life otherwise mortality are very high with the acute uh, variceal bleeding. So start from the basics. So uh, if you see upper GI bleeding is uh, usually defined as the uh, bleeding source proximal to the ligament of stretch and it is usually a life-threatening conditions and the upper GI bleeding uh, emergencies are characterized by certain things like hematemesis, melina, hematochesia, hematemesis is a fresh uh, blood per uh, orally is approximate to the ligament stretch. We talk about the melina. Melina is not basically a black color. It's a black tarry color stool, basically offensive in smell and sticking to the pan. This is a characteristic of the melina, usually present, uh, present with the melina in upper GI bleed. And second, third one is the hematochesia. Hematochesia is basically a fresh blood per rectum. So hematochesia usually occur in the cases of lower GI bleed, but in upper GI bleed, if patient is having the massive upper GI bleed, patient can manifest in the form of hematochesia. In that case, the patient will be hemodynamically very unstable. So, and last is the patient can present in the form of occult blood also. So coming to the incidence of upper GI bleed, so incidence of upper GI bleed is approximately 100 cases per one lakh of the uh, population. So bleeding from the upper GI tract is approximately four times more common than the lower GI bleed and uh, it's a major cause of mortality and morbidity. So mortality rates from upper GI bleeds are ranging from three to 15 percent and increases with the age. These are the potential sources of upper GI bleed. If you talk about the Indian scenario, the most common is the uh, portal hypertension, variceal bleeds around 46 percent, fat ulcer diseases like 32 percent, malaria with steer is around six to eight percent. And in, if you see, uh, uh, Around 2.8 percent cases, we do not find any identical cause. It's a pure bleeding is there. You have to search for the uh, cause. Coming to the risk factor, what are the potential risk factor uh, for upper GI bleed in which the mortality and morbidity are high? Age, age is more than 60. Severe comorbidities, active bleeding in the form of melina, hematochesia, or uh, uh, hematemesis, hypertension, blood transfusion. Uh, more transfusion required in patient and time of bleeding, severe coagulopathy, and patient is presented with a hemorrhagic shock. So these are the factors which are having high mortality in upper GI bleed. Now come to the how to evaluate a patient. So initial assessment, brief history and symptoms, then physical examination and laboratory workup. Well, uh, initial assessment is very important because here we have to assess whether your patient is hemodynamically stable or unstable because the management are different. So, the, uh, so before we have to confirm the cause clinically first, we are talking about the basics in this conference, back to basics. So basic history is the basic. We have to find out the basic cause for bleed, whether it is a, a variceal bleed or a non-variceal bleed. So by history, uh, if a very seal bleed is there, you can get, get a history of jaundice, liver diseases, like uh, uh, excessive uh, alcohol intake history will suspect the portal hypertension, very seal bleed. A patient is having history of H. pylori in the past and the NSAI chronic use, uneven alcohol can cause the peptic ulcer disease. And uh, in angiodysplasia, there's a history of aortic stenosis and hereditary hemorrhagic telangiasis. Yeah, we can suspect the angiodysplasia. So these are the common symptoms like upper abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting occur in the peptic ulcer disease. If you suspect the variceal bleed, we can have a, uh, a history of jaundice and then uh, yellowish discoloration. And then on examination, we can find the um, uh, clinical findings uh, relevant to the chronic liver disease or uh, portal hypertension. So vital assessment is a critical part of the examination and key component to assess the hemodynamically stable or unstable patient. BP is less than 100 mmHg and tachycardia more than 120 mmHg suggests the hemodynamically compromised and warrant the fluid resuscitation and blood transfusion are urgent is required. SpO2 to be measured, supplement oxygen if needed, and patient may complain of giddiness, sweating, palpitation, and may become a drowsy because of the hemodynamically compromised states. 
vital assessment, the patient is having a resting tachycardia, means the patient is having bleeding, more than 15% blood loss is there. The patient is having orthostatic hypertension, as in previous talks, sir has nicely elaborated this orthostatic hypertension. So in that case, patient is having the bleeding loss is more than 15%, but patient is having the supine hypertension, then the, the much, much loss, loss of blood is much more, it's around 40%. So we can assess by vital assessment. By abdominal examination, we can have a look for the cause, what are the causes of the quick abdominal examination like a patient, we suspect the varicel bleed. We have, we, uh, uh, will have the signs of chronic liver disease like a cytic or uh, splenomegaly, then uh, for parotid swelling or testicular atrophy or copper bed. So these are the signs we can get and we can suspect this, oh, it's a varicel bleeding. So upper GI bleed without ascites or splenomegaly uh, usually indicates a non-variceal cause. So now come to the workup. So these are the routine investigations, CBC, LFT, KFT, ABG, and serum electrolyte prothrombin timer. The basic initial investigation we have to send uh, immediately. In acute bleeding initially, HB will not drop. HB will be, it will not drop and because the patient is losing whole blood and within time, blood is diluted by influx of the extravascular fluid and hemoglobin is dropped down. So in acute bleeding, MCV does not alter. If MCV is low, we can uh, suspect chronic blood loss, history of chronic blood loss or occult blood will be there. Blood urea, nitrogen to creatinine or urea to creatinine ratio, the value will be more than 30 is to one or more than 100 is to one respectively seen in the upper GI bleach. So now come to the resuscitations. In initial management depend, management depend how your patient is stable or is unstable. Closely monitoring the airway, vital signs, cardiac rhythm, urine output, and a patient, uh, uh, keep patient nil orally, gastric lavage done to just uh, take, confirm the bleeding and supplement oxygen to be given. So if patient is unable, unstable, we have to maintain ABC airway, breathing, circulation, and disabilities. Airway needs to be secure if patient is altered, GCS is, GC, GCS is low than 18. Breathing, oxygen supplement by mask or ET tube. Circulation, immediately we have to put the two large cannula, at least 18 gauge are secured, and we have to stride the crystallite solution, 10, milli, 10 ml per kg bolus, and we'll repeat three times. If patient is, is still unstable, we can go for the transfusion. And in case of hemodynamical instability, at least two unit of PRBC uh, is required. Now we have to look for the disabilities also, like hypo, uh, like uh, hypos or hyperglycemia or hyponatremia. We should manage this disability accordingly. So indication of blood transfusion in upper GI bleed or acute variceal bleed in case of hemodynamically unstable. Straightforward, go for the at least two unit of PRBCs. But if patient is stable, the threshold of a transfusion is less than seven gram in adult and less than eight gram in old ages, and less than eight gram in a patient having the history of CAD. If a massive large amount of PRBCs is required, the platelet FFP is also given. The ratio of PRBC platelet FFP are given in one is to one ratio to avoid the dilutional coagulopathy. Avoid overtransfusion in case of acute variceal bleed. So, these are the specific treatment for the acute variceal bleed. Acid suppression by protein pump inhibitor. Immediately, we have to start with the uh, pentabrozole infusion, uh, IV infusion at 80 milligram bolus to be given, and then followed by 8 milligram per hour infusion. And PPI as a pre-endoscopic therapy is considered as a good treatment because is probably delay the endoscopy therapy and PPI may improve the outcome also. Prokinetic, role of prokinetic is before endoscopy we have to, uh, uh, we have to uh, clear the field, visualize the field for endoscopy, so prokinetic is required. Vasoactive medications, somatostatin and analog octreotide, then tadlipressin, are mainly used in the treatment of variceal bleed, and this can reduce the risk of bleeding due to the non-variceal cause also. So, and antibiotics, 
IV ceftriaxone or fluoroquinolones are given at least five to seven days to decrease the chances of spontaneous bacterial flora. And it's also decreased the patient go into the hepatic encephalopathy. Injection vitamin K to be given to combat the coagulopathy and the no role of tranexamic acid in the cases of pericial bleed. These are the a drug we use, uh, medical therapy we usually uh, go for in variceal bleed, octiotide or telepresence. Many times a question start uh, arising the whether you go for the octiotide or telepresence. So this literature and most of the studies shows uh, both are equally effective. These are the differences, somatostatin's analog, octiotide is a somatostatin analog, effective in the acute variceal bleed. It is FDA approved, cost effective, and safer and lesser side effect as compared to the telepresence. If you talk about the terlipresin, terlipresin is a basically a potent splanchnic vasoconstrictor. So it has a side effect also. Highly effective, but it's not USFD approved. It's a costly and need a specialist to be infused. And uh, the common side effects is that basically causes the, uh, if it's a vasoconstrictor, so it can cause the uh, coronary constriction, mesenteral constriction so can cause precipitate the MI, so we should avoid in the cases of coronary artery diseases, and it is, causes the mesenteric ischemia also. So these are the side effects we have to take care of that before giving the terlipresin. And if a hyponatremia is there, we should avoid the terlipresin. So, and it should be avoided in asthma and COPD also. Coagulopathy, antiplated and anticoagulant should be hold at the time of active bleeding and the PT, INR should be calculated. Duration of the hold of these drugs depend which type of drug, what severity of the bleeding is there, and how quickly we reverse this drug is required. So endoscopy should be, should not be delayed because of the antiplated or anticoagulant patient is on. So usually we are at to keep the INR less than 2.5, but it's a safe procedure and urgent FFP is transfusion done along with the injection vitamin K if it is INR is on the higher side. But Various studies shows that the endoscopy is safe, effective in patients who are mild to moderate, uh, coagulo, uh, coagulo, anticoagulated. So we have, uh, without any delay, we have to go for the endoscopic procedure. So these are the EV endoscopic variceal ligation and secondary prophylaxis for the best to prove the re-bleed. So if a patient, uh, endoscopy procedure, we have to go for the endoscopic variceal ligation done. If bleeding is not controlled, then we can go for the repeat endoscopy. If bleeding is controlled, then we'll go for the secondary prophylaxis in the form of beta blocker. And it's not controlled, then we uh, plan for tips. And before tips, we can uh, occlude by balloon tamponade. Prophylaxis by using the beta blocker. So uh, it's a non-selective beta blocker blocks the beta-2 mediated dilatation of the mesenteric arterioles, resulting in the vasoconstriction and subsequently decrease the portal blood flow. So the main aim of the propanol is to keep the H, uh, uh, HVPG is below 12 mmHg uh, to prevent the re-rupture of the varices. Prophylaxis it can be primary or secondary. Primary means there's no bleeding was there. Secondary, it is after the first episode of the bleeding. So if no history of bleeding, it's still the primary prophylaxis for the beta blocker is required if it is a grade two or three, but it is in grade one, small varices are there. Prophylaxis for beta blocker is not required in the great uh, small varices until patient is in a uh, uh, child focus code B or C. Secondary, we have to give the beta blockers, but in certain cases we have to uh, very cautious. If hypotension is there, hyponatremia is there, AKI in refractory atysis, we should uh, very careful for giving the beta blockers. These are the webinar consensus guideline on portal hypertension. The workshop was entitled as the satisfying risk and individualizing the care of portal hypertension. So various points were discussed in that workshop regarding the impact of the etiological therapy for cirrhosis and primary prevention for uh, decompensation, role of beta blocker for prophylaxis, management of the acute bleeding episodes, and prevention of the recurrent hemorrhage and other decompensating events. So consensus on the beta blocker. Beta blocker started on the basis of HVPG, and the aim is to keep below 12, uh, uh, which is clinically significant, uh, because above 12 is a clinically significant portal hypertension, so we have to keep it is below 12 or below 10. So in various patients with no viruses or small viruses, there's no role, except in child focus code C, uh, 
uh, varices size are medium or large, we have to go for the beta blocker, non-selective beta block will be used. A patient is having the gastric varices, in gastric varices, uh, we have to go for the uh, cyanoacrylate injection therapy, it's more effective than the prevention with the beta blocker. And the bleeding in the end-stage liver disease, refractory ascites, we have to take care of uh, giving the beta blocker. So these are the window hypotheses in which early cirrhosis, when there's no indication of beta blocker, and only beta blocker may be indicated when there is cardiovascular involvement. Is it? But in the cirrhotic patient, window opens, beta blocker are indicated here in the primary as well as the secondary prophylaxis uh, to prevent the bleed. Window closed, these are the uh, uh, contraindication of giving, or we should very cautious about giving the uh, beta blocker like in the refractory site is systolic blood pressure less than 100 milligram. 100 mm Hg, AKI is hepatorenal syndrome, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, sepsis, medic, poor medical follow-up, and patient is non-compliant, so we have to take care of giving the beta blocker. So, uh, by managing the acute episode, target, our target of the hemoglobin is around 7 to 8, more transfusion should not be required because at that time, patient is bleeding. If you give the over-transfusion, patient bleed man can increase. Uh, to prevent the systolic blood pressure, complication of acute bleeding episode, antibiotic prophylaxis, then vasoactive drug, I have already explained, ligation therapy. If a patient is having the gastric varices where glue is recommended, and early consideration of tips is done, if bleeding is not stopped, then EVL, in spite of giving the EVL and the beta blocker, then plan for the uh, tips or balloon tamponade. These are the tamponade we are using. Endoscopy, so early endoscopic therapy is recommended for the patient with acute uh, variceal bleed. These are the algorithms for the management of variceal bleed, resuscitation, then medical management, endoscopic sur services not available, then you continue the medical management, patient is still bleeding, then you go for the balloon tamponade and tr try to transfer the patient to a uh, higher center. So endoscopy is there, you go for the EVL and gastric varices, you go for the glue injection, cyanoacrylate glue. So these are the techniques which can be used for the esophageal varices and gastric varices. We are using the endovascular ligation and the glue therapy. Some scoring system are there to just see the prognosis and mortality of the or re-bleed in the patient like call score, Glasgow, Withhold score, and AMC score. And these are the uh, Rockhall score, the clinical and the endoscopic parameters are there. And then Glasgow, Withhold score, uh, score, total gas go with around 2 to 20, 0 to 23. Uh, score is 0 is associated with a low risk and need of endoscopy. M65, again, the scoring is not very much sensitive than other two. So we uh, assess. So just here, I summarize my talk. Acute variceal bleed is a potentially life-threatening and not intervened timely. And endoscopy is the main modality of diagnosis and management of acute variceal bleed. Initial assessment is crucial in predicting the re-bleed and the mortality, combination of the medical management, injection, thermal, mechanical method, give better results and novel modalities such as OT clips and the use procedures may replace uh, other method in future. Thank you, thank you so much for the patience hearing.